in the middle of those. So uh, if you go to Matthew and start going backwards, um, you'll hit it pretty quick. It's got seven chapters, so uh, we're going to be in the latter part of the first chapter and all of the second chapter this evening. Um, just to kind of remind us where we've been. Uh, uh, you can go ahead and throw that picture up. I, I guess I had pictures on my mind uh, when I was preparing this week. Uh, 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 so I'll, I'll kind of illustrate with a couple of pictures. Uh, so the, the, this past year when, uh, pr- pretty good picture except for the goober on the left-hand side of it. But uh, um, so when we, when we hiked Pikes Peak this, this last year, th- this was our first view of the peak. That is actually the peak, the, the, the peak in the background. The, the trail we did was 13 miles long and uh, started hiking at like 4 o'clock in the morning and on an adjacent ridge, so obviously we're, we're, we're on an adjacent uh, ridge right here, which connects to, to Pikes Peak, and uh, so about 9 a.m., this is taking about 9 a.m., and uh, this was our first view of Pikes Peak, and uh, so we had hiked for a couple of hours in the dark, and the sun had come up, and then uh, we had, we're, we're on this adjacent ridge, and we, we come around uh, the, the, the corner, and boom, there, there it is, Pikes Peak, and let, let me just, it, it I don't know what you think, but I think it looks like it's a long ways away right there, all right? I mean, it's like I am going to die, you know? But, uh, uh, but all, all you can see right there is, is the peak, all right? I mean, you know, it's Pikes Peak. It's, it's above tree line. It's the only thing above tree line. That's, that's definitely Pikes Peak, but you can't really make out any of the details. All you got is the really big picture, all right? So if you flip to the next picture... Uh, this is, we're, we're about a mile from the summit right here. And, uh, so we're actually on Pikes Peak. We're above tree line. You can't see any of that green, uh, that green grass right there. You can't see any of that from the first picture. You can't make out individual boulders. You couldn't see the trail. There were marmots up there that would make this weird sound at you. And man, you, but you, so there's all these details that, uh, you can see in this picture that you can't see in the other picture. The first picture, all you can see is, is kind of the, the big idea. And then as we, as we zoom in, you're able to, to begin to see individual details in, in this second picture. Well, that, that, that really is a uh, kind of an illustration of what we're going to see tonight. Uh, the, latter, the, the latter part of Micah chapter 1 and all of chapter 2 uh, revolves around a single event, historical event. And that historical event is uh, 701 B.C., R- right at the end of the 8th century B.C., 701 B.C. It is the, the, the invasion of Judah. Now, if you remember from last week's uh, message that in 721 B.C., Assyria uh, swarms into the land, destroying Aram or Syria, depending upon your version, which is to the north of Israel. So destroys Syria, destroys Israel. The capital city of Israel is Samaria. In God's judgment, Assyria is allowed to destroy Samaria, carry off the inhabitants of the land, the northern kingdom ceases to exist at that point. So that was last week's message in that first oracle of Micah chapter 1. That's 721 B.C. Within 20 years, and and remember at that time, Judah, the southern kingdom, Jerusalem being the capital, has an alliance with Assyria, which when you read the book of Isaiah, you discover was absolutely the opposite of God's will. Well, it seemed to make sense in 721. In 721, Samaria is destroyed. The, the, the inhabitants are carried off into, uh, into, in, into exile. Uh, Judah and Jerusalem are not attacked at that point because Assyria is allied with them. Well, within two decades, by 701, uh, that uh, script is completely flipped. Uh, Judah, through Hezekiah, uh, rebels against Assyria. Assyria invades, 
And um, if not for the intervention of God, which we're going to see tonight, um, the, the fate of Judah certainly would have been the, the fate of the northern kingdom, Israel. Uh, so what we see tonight is in, in, the, in the latter part of the first chapter, chapter 1, verses 10 through the end of the chapter, we, we have a big picture. And that big picture is Assyria's invasion of Judah. Assyria's invasion of Judah. That's the big picture. In, in the second chapter, uh, we have three, me- three individual messages which, which answer the question of why. Uh, and the, the, the answer of why has to do with uh, covetousness false pro- and false prophecy. And so we're going to see that in two messages in the second chapter. And then, so verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2 and verses 6 through 11 of chapter 2 are those two messages. And then uh, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2 is its own own message. And uh, that message speaks of, of God's intervention. Uh, so the big picture, the details, and uh, God's intervention. And so we're going to, there's three pieces. We're going to look at 5,000 feet, 500 feet in the future. All right, the, 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 those are the three points. 5,000 feet, uh, 5,000 feet, 500 feet, and, and the future. So if you have your Bible, let's, let's read it together. It's a, it's a fairly extended text, but uh, uh, to kind of give us the picture, we, uh, we need to look at the whole thing. Plus, you get to laugh at me as I try to pronounce these Old Testament names. And uh, so uh, we'll just see how it goes. So uh, chapter 1, Micah chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Tell it not in Goth, weep not at all. At Beth Leofra, roll yourself in the dust. Go on your way, inhabitant of Shafir, in shameful nakedness. The inhabitant of Zayanan does not escape. The lamentation of Beth Ezel, he will take from you its support. For the inhabitant of Maroth becomes weak, waiting for good. Because a calamity has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the chariot to to the team of horses, O inhabitant of Lachish. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. For in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. Therefore you will give parting gifts on behalf of Moresheth Goth. The houses of Oxib will become a deception to the kings of Israel. Moreover, I will bring on you the one who takes possession, O inhabitant of Mershah. The glory of Israel will enter Adalim. Make yourself bold, make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like the eagle, for they will go from you into exile. Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work evil out on their beds. When morning comes, they do it. For it is in their power. It is in the power of their hands. They covet fields and they seize them. And houses and they take them away. They rob a man in his house and a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks. You will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. On that day, they will take up against you a taunt and utter a bitter lamentation and say, we are completely destroyed. He exchanges the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To the apostate, he apportions our fields. Therefore, you will have no one stretching a measuring line for you by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Do not speak out. So they speak out. But if they do not speak out concerning these things, reproaches will not be turned back. Is it being said, O house of Jacob? Is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to the one walking uprightly? Recently, my people have arisen as an enemy. You strip the robe off the garment from the unsuspecting passers-by, from those returned from war. 
the women of my people you evict, each one from her pleasant house. From her children you take my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place for rest because of the uncleanness that brings on destruction, a painful destruction. If a man walking after wind and falsehood had told lies and said, I will speak to you concerning wine and liquor, he would be a spokesman to these people. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. They break out. They pass through the gate and they go by it. So their king goes on before them, and the Lord at their head. One event, and that event is the invasion of Judah in 701 B.C. One event, four messages. The first message is 5,000 feet. The second and third message are 500 feet, and the uh, the fourth message is the future, uh, which is also in 701, which we'll look at that in just a second. And so for, let, let, let's go to 5,000 feet. Let's get the big picture here. So last week we ended with lament. You'll remember verses 8 and 9 serve as a transition between messages. And verse 9 concluded, for her wound is incurable. And then it says this. It says, for it has come to Judah. This, this, uh, th this judgment of God, for it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. That's verse 9 of chapter 1. This is clearly the siege of 701, and it takes us all the way through chapter 2. And so there's this image, the gate of Jerusalem. So we see it in 1-9, but we also see it in 1-12. Look at 1-12. It's the middle part of the verse. It says, but because a calamity has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. So there's that connection. And then we see it again in the second chapter in verse 13. It says, the breaker goes up before them. They break out and they pass. Where do they? They pass through the gate and they go out by it. So their king goes on before them, the Lord at their head. So there's this image of the gate of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which ties all of this information together. This is the siege of 701, the first message of 5,000 feet describing Assyria overrunning Judah in its, in its advance towards Jerusalem. In, and, and, and in this situation, geography helps. It, it, it would have been easier to hike down Pikes Peak than up it. We thought about doing that. Probably should have. Uh -huh. it, 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 it would have been a lot easier to hike down Pikes Peak than, than, than hike up it. And the same is true for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Jerusalem is for a reason. It's the high point. Jerusalem is the high point. Obviously, the coastland is the low point. And in between the high, the, the high places of Judah of which, where Jerusalem is, and, and the coastland, there's an area often referred to in, in the Old Testament as the foothills. Uh, sometimes it is referred to as the Shephelah. And it, it, it is the, it is, so it's the region between the high place and the low place. And, in the old te and, and it's, it's very strategic uh, in, in, in this sense that Jerusalem is where it is, but it's a fortified city and it's defendable. And in the Old Testament, the, the Judean kings fortified the cities of the foothills. And that, that they did that as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a military, a strategic military move. And if, if Judah is to be invaded, the, the fortified cities of the Shephelah of the foothills would have to be overrun before Jerusalem could, could be sieged. And so we, we read in the, uh, in the Old Testament of these Judean kings fortifying the, 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 the cities of the Shephelah. For, for example, it speaks of Rehoboam. You'll remember Rehoboam is, is the son of Solomon. 
And it says of Rehoboam, it says, Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem, and he built cities for defense in Judah. Thus he built Bethlehem, Edom, Tekoa, Bethzur, Soka, Adalim, which is in our text today, Gath, which is in our text today, uh, Mershah, which is in our text today, Ziph, Adoram, Lachish, which is in our text today, Azekah, Zorah, Ajalon, and, and Hebron. And then it says this, which are fortified cities in Judah and in Benjamin. We can look at other texts where Judean kings are fortifying the cities of the Shephelah. Uh, now, these are rolled over by Assyria in their invasion. And they're rolled over by Assyria during the invasion of 701 because this is the judgment of God. And there, there's a rhetorical a rhetorical device used here that, that we could easily miss in English. The, 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 the meaning of each of these towns mentioned here in Micah chapter 1, um, the, the name of the town sounds like a Hebrew word, and the, the, Micah chapter 1 is playing off of that to make a point. So, so for example, Bethlehophra sounds like dust. And in verse 10, it says that God says he's going to, he, he tells them to roll themselves in the dust. Shafir sounds like beautiful. And yet God says they will be left in shameful nakedness. That's the first part of verse 11. Za'anon sounds like go out. But verse 11, God says they will not escape. Beth Ezel means take away. But God says in the latter part of verse 11, he will take from them their support. Marath means bitter things. God says they become weak waiting for good. Morsheth sounds like betrothed, but God alludes to parting gifts, verse 14. Axib sounds like deceitful. God says their houses will become a deception, verse 14. Mershah means possession. God says he will bring on them one who takes possession. And it's, uh, it's, it's undeniable that this is what the text is doing. That this, uh, that this, God, is, God is making a point. And, and, and the point that he is making is this. You trust in these fortified cities, but in my judgment, the kingdom of Assyria is going to roll over them like they weren't even there. And th th so that, that, that's the reason that, uh, you know, rhetorically speaking, this is very powerful. Sometimes how you say something is just as impactful as what you say. And this is powerful rhetoric. Judah is foolish to trust in their own strength. They're foolish to trust in their own fortifications. They should instead, according to verse 16, they should make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like the eagle, for they will go from you into exile. This prophecy is fulfilled in 701. Now, Jerusalem is spared. We'll look at that in a moment due to the repentance of the king and others. But not before Judah is overrun. Many, many are carried off into exile and those that are left and, and the rest are left behind the walls of, of Jerusalem. So we, we would be naive to look at the event of 701 and say, whoo, dodged a bullet there. I mean, this is mass destruction. Jerusalem is spared, but lots of people die. Lots of people carried off into exile. Why? Judgment. Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, uh, we, have his, uh, we have his chronicles, and um, this is an extra biblical um, text, and uh, he, he wrote of this event, Sennacherib, uh, and he, he said that, he said, I shut up Hezekiah inside Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage, blockading the capital and turning back any who went out of its city gates. That, that, that's what Sennacherib said. He, 
He just left out the part where God intervened and smacked him down. But we'll, we won't leave that part out, all right? We'll, we'll, we'll get to there in just a second. But that's 5,000 feet. So, so 5,000 feet is, is Assyria swarming into Judah, invading the land as, as, as an act of God's judgment. Why? I mean, the, 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 these are God's people. This is the covenant people of God. It would be unthinkable that God will allow a pagan, it actually in the text it refers to uh, Assyria as apostate, defiled. It, it, it would be unthinkable that Assyria would be allowed to roll through Judah to the gates of Jerusalem. Why did it happen? Well, that's 5,000 feet, and the answer is 500 feet, and the answer is judgment. Judgment, P- particularly two to, to, two truths are, are listed as, as or, or sources of, of, of God's judgment or reasons for God's judgment. And uh, the, the, those are uh, the powerful's exploitation of the weak. It, it talks about that extensively throughout the second chapter. The powerful's exploitation of the weak. And secondly, it speaks of the false prophet's promise of peace. The, the, the powerful's expo- exploitation of the weak and the, the, the false prophet's promise of peace. So, so first, the, uh, the powerful's exploitation of, of the weak, this is verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 and 2 really tell us what we need to know. So chapter 2, verse 1, Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When the morning comes, they do it. For it is in their, the power of their hands. They covet fields and they seize them. And houses and they take them away. They rob a man in his house. A man and his inheritance. You know, what, what, what's going on here? Well, the, these folks are acting like Ahab. Now, we, we, we have to back up 100 years and go to the northern kingdom to talk about Ahab. But we, we, you, you, you remember Ahab? He, he went, there was a man named Naboth, and, I, and Ahab wanted his vineyard. Do you remember that? And so he, he, goes, to, he, he goes to Naboth, and, and, and he says, sell me your, Naboth, sell me your vineyard. Do you remember Naboth's response? It wasn't, well, I'll think about it, king. It was God forbid. That's what he says. God forbid forbid. He says, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. First Kings 21 verse 3. Now, we, we, we may struggle to, to kind of grasp this because we, we think so differently, but man, to, to, to sell Ahab that land, uh, it's like giving away Grandpa's pocket knife. You know, I, I mean, it, the, the, the land that you have, you have as an inheritance. You have it as an inheritance from the Lord. It's not yours to sell. It's not yours to give away. It, it, it is to be received as a blessing from the Lord. And so just because Ahab's powerful, just because Ahab's the king, he doesn't have any right to ask that of Naboth. Naboth is exactly right. That's exactly what he should have said. God forbid that I do that, king. If you remember the rest of the story, Ahab sticks his thumb in his mouth. He goes home. He whines to his wife Jezebel. She has Naboth killed. And killed. Ahab seizes that property, and he's happy All right? until the judgment of God comes. And so in Jerusalem, you know, go back to our text this evening, you go back to Jerusalem, the idea is this. There, there are a powerful few, and that powerful few are using their power to, to gobble up the wealth of the land. And so the wealth of the land finds itself in fewer and fewer and fewer hands in the latter part of the 8th century B.C. So in 2.8, it says... Recently, my people have arisen as an enemy. You strip the robe off the garment from unsuspecting passersby, from from those returned from war. The the women of my people you evict. 
each one from her pleasant house, from her children, you take my splendor forever, and that's speaking about uh, the, 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 the heritage of the land, from her children, you take my splendor forever. This is the powerful's exploitation of the weak in their covetousness and their greed. Isaiah speaks of it, a contemporary of Micah. Isaiah speaks of it in Isaiah 5, 8. He says, woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there is no more room so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. The powerful were using their position to monopolize the wealth of the land and judgment came. Verse 3, chapter 2, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks, and you will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. And the pronouncement is almost certainly carried out. In 701 B.C., judgment did come. I want us to pause here for just a second and just kind of observe this. We see this sin in our own time. We see this sin in our own time. The, the wealth of the land is gathered into fewer and fewer and fewer hands. The fewer at ease and many are never given the opportunity to succeed. And it is a disturbing trend. Now, let me be clear. Not all that passes under the banner of social justice is social justice. I mean, I, I hope you can acknowledge that. I, I, I hope that's self-apparent. Individuals love to throw around the term social justice, and they love to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the, the oppressed at the expense of the powerful. And we, the, we, so it, it's, uh, we, we, we live in, a, in an age of where this is powerful rhetoric. Um, so not all that passes under the banner of social justice is social justice. But let me go on to say this. God does care about social justice. And so we, we should, as God's people, we, we should be very aware of, of the weak around us. And we, and we should fulfill the will of God by helping the weak around. Isn't that what James said? He, he spoke of, of pure and undefiled religion. And what was pure and undefiled religion? To help the orphans and to help the widows in their distress. And so, so here in, 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 in Micah's time, there are powerful individuals who are using their power to exploit the weak. They're using their power to exploit the weak. And, and God, that, that God says that he is going to, to judge that situation. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So judgment came in part because of the powerful's exploitation of the weak. But there's a second reason the judgment came upon Judah, and that's described in verse 6. So verses 6 through 11 is a separate message, a separate oracle, and it speaks of the false prophet's promise of peace. The false prophet's promise of peace. There's always the guy who will tell you what you want to hear. You know, we could, we could look at Ahab again, you know, uh, back back up 100 years to the northern kingdom and Ahab. And, and there was a contemporary, the, the, the contemporary of Ahab at that time, the, the Judean king was a man named Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was in alliance with Ahab, which was a bad idea, all right? But the, so they're... The, the, they're that they're in conference together and they're trying to decide whether or not they are going to go to war against a kingdom to the north, the kingdom of Aram. And so Ahab gathers all these false prophets around him and they're saying, do it, king, God's with you, yay. And Jehoshaphat, he has enough, you know, wisdom about him to, to, to say, man, isn't, isn't, there a, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh we can ask? I mean, do, do, do I really got to, man, am I, do I really want to go to war based upon the, you know, these prophets of Baal? Is it, it, isn't there a prophet of, of, of Yahweh we, we can ask about this? And, and Ahab says this, yeah, there's one, but I hate him. 
because he never tells me what I want to hear. His name is Micaiah. It's not Micah, Micaiah. And Jehoshaphat goes, we're going to need to hear from him. And they go to get him, and, and you know, his message is obviously the exact opposite. But the, 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 there's, always the, there's always the guy who'll, who will tell you what you want to hear. And so here in 701, there, there's these false prophets who are, are speaking lies and saying that, man, it's going to be all right. Verse 6 here, it says, do, so, so the, these false prophets and the people do not speak out. Do not speak out, so they speak out. But if they do not speak out concerning these things, reproaches will not be turned back. So, so the verse begins by saying that the true prophets are being told to shut up. They indicates a plurality of prophets, Micah, Isaiah, and Hosea, for sure. It's good to not be alone in opposition. The verse concludes by saying that their silence would not bring about a different result. That they're not speaking judgment into existence. They're instead informing the nation of God's determined will. So in verse 11, it says this. It says, if a man walking after wind and falsehood had told you lies... I will speak out to you concerning wine and liquor. He would be spokesman to these people. Verse 11 is saying, is saying this, that, that there's this, that these false prophets who are uh, speaking deception, this is exactly what the people want to hear. And so Mike is saying, man, if, 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 if I rounded up a guy that said, hey, bring out the beer and liquor, no judgment. Mike is saying, you, you, you'd elect that guy as your spokesman. But judgment is here. Judgment is here. You, you, you don't want the guy that tells you what you want to hear. You want to be told the truth. He said, you'd elect that guy as your spokesman. But judgment is, judgment is here. Judgment is coming. It's not time, they're saying it's not time for wailing and lament, but instead it's time for wine and liquor. They were wrong. Judgment swept into and through the land in 701 B.C. Assyria was at the gate of Jerusalem. And so, so the question is, is that the end of the story? Did Assyria knock down the gate and carry off the inhabitants of Jerusalem just as it had been done 20 years earlier to, to Samaria? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Micah, I mentioned this last week, but, but Micah, there's three cycles to Micah. And in, in, there's 20 or 21 messages, and they're, they're, they're broken into three cycles. And in each of those cycles, there are, there are messages of judgment, but the, the last message in each, each cycle is a message of promise and hope. And so, so here in verses 12 and 13 of the second chapter, we... Uh, we have the future, 5,000 feet, 500 feet, the future, and the gate reappears. The gate reappears. So you'll notice in verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. And this speaks of how the, the, the inhabitants of, of Judah come into Jerusalem as in anticipation of this siege. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like a sheep in the fold. So they're gathering into Jerusalem in anticipation of this siege. Like a flock in the midst of its pastor, pasture, they will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. So Assyria is coming into the land, about to break up against the walls of Jerusalem. But then it says this, the people, they break out and they pass through the gate and they go out by it. Their king goes before them. The Lord is at their head. So if I could just give you some Old Testament here. We're in the Old Testament, but if I could just give you some, 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 his, some historical events in the Old Testament to make, uh, make sense of those last two verses. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, besieges Jerusalem. He threatens the people, 
and he mocks God. That's 2 Chronicles 32, 15. He is actually not at Jerusalem. He's at Lachish, which is just a few miles away, another fortified city. But he sends his commander to Jerusalem, which already has the gates closed. And you'll remember that the commander mocks God, mocks the king, and mocks the true prophets. 2 Chronicles 32, 15. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah pray. 2 Chronicles 32, 20. God does what those fortified cities never could. 2 Chronicles 32, 21 through 23. But I'll read out of 2 Kings because the, the exact language of 2 Kings, which also chronicles these events, help us to understand Micah. The beginning words are the words of the prophet Isaiah. So 2 Kings 19, beginning in verse 29, it says, Then this, this shall be a, shine, a sign for you. You will eat this year what, what grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the, the same, and the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards. So it's speaking of a future, even though in 701 it appears that there is going to be no future. But, but here it speaks of planting vineyards in the third year. Reap, plant vineyards, eat of their fruit. The surviving remnant, which is mentioned in Micah 2, 12 and 13, the surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant. And out of Mount Zion, survivors. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. He will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he will return, and he will not come to this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, and he returned home, and he lived in Nineveh. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God, that Adramelech and Sherazer killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And Ezrahadon, his son, became king in his place, 2 Kings 19, 29 through 37. So what do we learn in Micah 2, 12 and 13? Their shepherd, this was the prophecy. Their shepherd would gather them into Jerusalem to protect them. Their king, their God, would defeat their enemy for them. Their Lord would lead them out, out of the gates of Jerusalem, in peace and in victory. And what was prophesied in Micah 2, we see is fulfilled in 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings. That is exactly what happened. And so the takeaway is this. The answer is never in fortified cities. The answer is never in foreign alliances. The answer is always in the faith of their God. He is the one that brings the victory. So here's the outline thus far. Micah 1, 1 through 8. It's an oracle of prophecy against Samaria, the capital city of Israel. It's fulfilled in 721 B.C. The northern kingdom is judged, ceased to, ceases to exist at that point. Verses 9 and 10 of the first chapter are, are transitory. It transitions from that oracle to the next oracle, the, the next oracle, which is uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through the end of the chapter, speaks of the, the overrunning of Judah, using those various fortified city names to make a rhetorical point, 5,000 feet. Then you get into chapter 2, verses 
1 through 5 is an oracle, verses 6 through 11 is an oracle, and verses 12 through 13 is an oracle. The first two of those give the reasons why. Why is, why is Jerusalem judged? Well, lots of reasons, but the two that are given here is the, the powerful's exploitation of the weak and the, the false prophet's, prophet's message of peace. That's the why. But God intervenes. King Hezekiah, the prophet Isaiah, and others join together in prayer. They ask God to do what only God can do. And in response to the, the king's repentance, in response to the prophet's petition, God steps in, destroys the army of Assyria, and verses 12 and 13 are fulfilled. God's people... The gates are flung open, and, and God's people exit the gates being led by their king and their God who has won the victory for them. And that gets us through the second chapter. Let's pray together. God, we love you, and we, we thank you for, for loving us, God. Our, God, our takeaway is, God, uh, victory is through faith. Uh, God, it's, uh, God, it's not... It's not God, we're not going to succeed because of who we know. God, we're not going to succeed because of um, uh, the power of money or the, uh, God, the power of connections or, God, our, uh, God, our own um, strength. God, that, 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 that's, just, that's just not going to work. Uh, God, uh, victory, uh, victory is found through faith in, in, in an all-powerful God who loves us. And so, Father, I pray this week we'd, we'd live by faith, you'd be glorified through it, and, God, you would, you would give the victory. We love you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. Chapter 3, so uh, go to Matthew, begin to go backwards, uh, there should be 12 small books, the Minor Prophets, right in the middle of those is Micah, the prophet Micah, and we're going to be in the third chapter together this evening. I sure like, um, man, I, I know the Bradford pears are invasive, but I kind of like seeing them, you know, I mean, that first thing to bloom out, and I, I kind of like, I know they're Bradford pears, but I kind of like to imagine the dogwoods, you know, same color. And, uh, man, I, I'm like, man, spring is coming. And uh, uh, so I start getting a little bit excited a around this time of year. And I, um, uh, you know, begin to go out and look at my beehives and watch them come out and fly. And they'll, they'll hit them Bradford pears. A Bradford pear bloom stinks to high heaven. All right? I mean, it's just, it's a stinky flower. Uh, but the, the, the bees... They're just happy to have anything, all right? So, man, they'll, they'll hit them bad for pears. I'll, I'll start getting real excited when, when the red buds start to bloom out. I mean, that's when I, I mean, but before they even bloom out, you know, you can see them red buds, the leaves come out, they start to get green, and uh, I, man, spring is here at, at that point. And so, grass will begin to grow, and when that grass begins to grow, here's the experiment. All right, you take a five-by-foot section, a uh, five-by-five put, foot section in your yard, and you get a pump sprayer, and you fill it with miracle Grow fertilizer, and you spray that five-by-five-foot section with miracle Grow. Put down that pump sprayer. Get your other pump sprayer. Put diesel in it, all right? Go over, and in the very next five-by-five-foot section, I want you to just douse that thing with diesel, all right? And I want you to observe what happens. All right? It's not, I man, you don't have to guess. It's inevitable. I can tell you what, what's going to happen. The one over here is going to produce life. The one over here is going to produce death. All right? That's just cause and consequence. And in Micah chapter 3 tonight, we see cause and consequence. All right? We see there, there are three uh, messages with a common theme in Micah chapter 3. The theme is injustice. 
And specifically, we're going to look at the injustice uh, of the judges, the injustice uh, of the prophets, and the injustice of the leaders in general. And that third message is going to be uh, cumulative. It's going to build on, on the previous two. So there are four, th- these messages are four verses apiece. So verse 1 through 4 is a message. Verse 5 through 8 is a message. And verse 9 through 12 is a message, but with a common theme, injustice. The, the cause is injustice, and the consequence in each of these, what I want us to see, the consequence in each of these is the removal of the presence of God. All right? And the, the reason that is the case is because that is always the consequence of sin and rebellion, the removal of the presence of God. And so we see it with the judges, the false prophets, and uh, with the leaders. So if you have your Bible, let's look together, Micah chapter 3, look with me at verse 1, and I said, hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate evil, you who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them up as for the pot, as meat in a kettle. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to to bite with their teeth, they cry, peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. Therefore, it will be night for you without vision and darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will all cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. On the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious acts, even to Israel his sin. Now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord, saying, Is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. Therefore, On account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. And the mountain of the temple will become a high place of the forest. Micah prophesies, if you'll remember, Micah prophesies in the latter half of the 8th century B.C. into at least the first decade, maybe the second decade of the 2nd century, 7th century um, B.C., and it's a mess. I mean, it is a mess. Now, the, the, the undiscerning would attribute the mess to a resurgent Assyria, the, 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 the kingdom to the to the, uh, to the east that was powerful, and then they went through a period of weakness, and, and during that period of weakness, uh, Israel had a strong king, Jeroboam II, Judah had a strong king, um, uh, uh, Uzziah, and, and you put those, those factors together, Assyria weak in the east, strong kings in Judah and Israel, and things are pretty good. Well, the flip scripts, the, 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 the script flips about 750 B.C., 
there's a resurgence of Syria. Uh, there's weakening and decay within Israel and Judah. It's a mess. And in, in 721 B.C., Samaria, the capital city of, of the northern kingdom, Israel, uh, is destroyed, and the people are carried off into exile. Uh, looks like the same thing's going to happen to Judah. In, in 701 B.C., uh, Assyria sweeps through. We looked at this last Sunday evening. Assyria sweeps through uh, the, the foothills of Judah, knocking over one fortified city after the next. And before it's all said and done, uh, the Sennacherib is at Lachish, and he has sent his, his general to Jerusalem, and there, uh, man, the gates are shut. The city's going to be surrounded. Assyria is going to knock out Jerusalem. It is almost inevitable. And we, we looked at last week how God intervened. We'll talk about that again here uh, in a moment. But it's a mess. And so the undiscerning individual would look at it and say, well, strong Assyria, and they're bad. All right? That's the problem. But the, the, the discerning the, the, the discerning individual, the spiritual individual, understands that the problem's not a theory at all. The problem's at home. The, the, the problem's in Judah. The problem's in Israel. And so here in this third chapter specifically, we see that, that part of the problem is the leadership in Judah. And we see that, that God specifically addresses the judges, the prophets, and then the leaders, all right? And uh, the causes and justice and the consequences, the removal of the presence of God in each of these three messages. So, so first, let's look at the first four verses, and let's see God's uh, message through Micah to the judges. And so, uh, and, I, uh, and I, and I said, so that's the beginning of this first message, thus says the Lord, that's verse 5, that's the beginning of the second message, and now hear this, verse 9, that's the beginning of the third message. So here in verse 1, this first message, and I said, hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? And that, 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 that question is an accusation. Is it not for you to know justice? And the answer is absolutely. That's your job. That's your role. That's your stewardship. It is for you to know justice. But that's not what is, that's not what is occurring. Is it not for you to know justice? To the judges of which the royal house is a part, the question is, is it not for you to know justice? And yes, it is. That's their role. That's their stewardship from the Lord. Yet it, yet it says of them in verse 2, it says, You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones. And, and the imagery is graphic. Their stewardship is one of protection, but instead... They use their position to fatten themselves. They are promoting themselves through the destruction and the consumption of others. And aren't those the options of, of leadership? You, 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 can either, you can either use that position you've been given to fatten yourself and to promote yourself, or, or, or you can use it as a, as, a, as a platform from which to help people. You, you, you can use it as, a, as an instrument through which you, you serve other people. Well, these judges are, are, are certainly doing the former. They are fattening themselves. They're, they're, their task is to protect, and yet they're fattening themselves through the role. God says of them, they hate good and they love evil. The, the, the idea of good to them is, what's good for me? Micah's contemporary says the same. Isaiah says it like this in Isaiah 5, verse 20. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, 
and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the one who are in the right. Man, I don't often quote Marvel comics. You know, I try to just stick with the Bible. Uh, but uh, man, what one applied? What, what what was Spider? What was Spider Man's? It was was it Peter Parker? Is that Peter Parker? All right, uh, Uncle Ben got this one right. All right, I, I, I better quote him. I, I I don't trust myself to do it. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. Remember that? Remember that movie? They're sitting in the car right before Uncle Ben gets gets murdered. And uh, that's what happened, at least in the movie. I mean, I, uh, but I mean, that, that, that's what he tells Peter. He's, he, he says to him, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. But, but I, I, better, I better put it in the words of Jesus, all right? Jesus says it like this. He says, to whom much is entrusted of him, much will be asked. To whom much is entrusted to him, much will be asked, Luke 12, 48. Yet these individuals were not doing that. They've been given much, but they were using that position to fatten themselves. They, they were figuratively eating those to whom they were supposed to care. I mean, look what verse 3 says. It presents this. Now, this is, these judges are not literally eating people. All right, that, that, that's not the point. The, the point is they have a role. That role is a role of protection. They are under shepherds of God is the good shepherd. They are under shepherds. They're supposed to be caring for the flock. They're supposed to be leading the flock. They're supposed to be protecting the flock, but instead they're eating the flock. And so in verse three, it says this. It says, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their bones from them, break their bones and chop them up as meat for the pot and as meat in a kettle. I mean, those are harsh words. That's the cause. And the consequence concludes the message in verse 4. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. The crying out is in a moment of judgment. The not answering and the hiding his face is the removal of the presence of God. The judgment is ultimately the absence of God, and this is always the judgment. Adam and Eve were, remo were removed from the presence of God. Judgment. God proposed going forward without him following the incident of the exodus with the golden calf. Judgment. We see it over and over and over again. On the cross, Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hell is described as being cast from the presence of God into outer darkness. God is the source of life, and to be removed from his presence produces the reality of death. Judgment is the removal of the presence of God. Always has been, always will be. And so the cause here is the injustice of these judges, and the, the, the consequence is God said, a day is going to come, judges, when you're in trouble. And on that day, you're going to call out for me because I'm the only one that can help you. And in that moment, silence. Silence. In that moment, no response from God. The presence of God has been removed from these judges as a consequence to their sin and rebellion. So that's the message to the judges. And we have a similar message in verses uh, 5 through 8 with the prophets. Different role, very similar situation. It is the misuse of position at the expense of others. So verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to bite with their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. Three observations are worthy of note from those verses. Observation number one. 
the error in both, in both the first message and the second message, the first message to the judges, the second message to the prophet, to the prophets, the error in both is explained using the imagery of eating, who eat the flesh of my people, verse 3, when they have something to bite with their teeth, verse 5, that, that they consume what they've been called to protect. That, 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 is, that is common in both of these messages. They consume that which they have been called to protect. Second observation is the phrase, my people, which appears in verse 3 and in verse 5. My people. And so you'll notice in verse 5, it says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. Now, I want, I want you to read that verse real carefully, and I want you to an, ask and answer this question. When, when, when it says my people, who's my refer to? When it says my people, who's my refer to? So, so, and what I mean by that is this. Verse 5, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead. Now, Micah is talking. He references God. And then without quoting God, he refers to the people as my people. Now, so who is my? It is not the Lord in verse 5. It's the prophet Micah. It's the prophet Micah. He's speaking of these, of these false prophets, and he says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. It would be his people if, if the noun was Lord. The, the prophet speaks of himself. This will become very clear in verse 8. Th this is contrastive because Micah is a prophet. The judges and the prophets are consuming the people, but Micah has a burden to protect and lead the people. They cry, peace, but, but it's all about them. They're there to consume the people. But, but in contrast, look what Micah says about himself in verse 8. He says, on the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. You see, Micah had a burden for his people, which compelled him to tell them the truth and to warn them of the judgment that was to come. He was empowered to do so through the Spirit of God. He says that he is empowered to tell the people of their sin and rebellion. The same two words which appeared in 1-5. And if you remember all the way back two weeks ago, that first message, that first prophecy was directed to the northern kingdom. And in verse 5, it, it says that the northern kingdom is being confronted with their sin and rebellion. And if you remember back two weeks ago, it didn't work out so well. In, in fact, in 721, Samaria is destroyed. Judgment falls. Why? Because of sin and rebellion. And so here we are in the third chapter, and, and the idea is this. Well, what Micah wants Judah to understand is this. Judah, what happened to Samaria 20 years ago, it very well could happen to you today. You, you are not immune you, you, you are not immune to the judgment of God in response to the sin and rebel, in, in response to sin and rebellion. So, so Micah says that he is empowered and he is burdened to speak truth, to speak of the sin and the rebellion of his people. They saw what had happened in Samaria. They're not immune. Micah was burdened for the nation to get this. One commentator says it like this. He says, speaking to Micah, it says, he loved the sheep that those bad shepherds led astray. And he longed to bring them back to the paths of righteousness and the pastures of God's truth. How dare they misdirect them? The people for whom he feels so responsible deserve better prophets than these. Yet their presence makes his own task Harder. First observation, 
this imagery of eating. The, the second observation, the my people in verse 5. The third observation is this. At the end of verse 5, it, it ultimately concludes that these false prophets lead the people astray. And if you'll remember that Micah has three cycles, verse chapters 1 and 2, chapters 3, 4, and 5, and then chapters 6 and 7. And in each cycle, it begins with bad news, and it concludes with good news. In each, the good news is described using the imagery of a shepherd. In 2.12, I will put them together like sheep in a fold, like a, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. 4.8, as for you, tower of the flock, heel of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. 7.14, shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession. The good shepherd leads the people to green pastures, but the under-shepherds are leading them astray. And that is being challenged here in the middle part of chapter 3. Aren't you proud of your publicly, publicly funded OETA station? If you didn't catch the irony in my voice, I could say it again. OETA honors Sunday every week by giving an hour-long program to the president of Planned Parenthood. And I know that, and um, I don't watch that. <laughs> but last Sunday, I was, um, I was flip, you know, Sunday afternoon, I was flipping through the stations on the television. I don't know why I do that. There's never anything on, but I was. And so I'm, fl I'm flipping through the uh, station on television, and uh, we don't have cable, so uh, I I only get about, we only get about six stations, and three of those are OETA, all right, you know, Tulsa, Fort Smith. I think I'm getting the, I, I think the wind moved the antenna. I think I'm getting a third one now, all right? Uh, and um, so I'm, flip, I'm flipping through these stations, and I, I catch this, um, uh, I, I just, man, I'm, I'm flipping through one of those OET, OETA stations, and uh, I, see, uh, I see two individuals wearing the old uh, uh, ministerial... I don't know what that thing's called. Uh, collar? Okay. And so, man, I, I don't, ah, what, what's this going on here? And so I, I stop and I listen. Ter, ter, Terry and I are in the front room. and we, So uh, we, we begin to watch this program, and uh, it's two uh, Episcopalian priests. And uh, one male, one female. And the, uh, they're, they're discussing recent moves within the Church of England in the Anglican Church, and uh, they, th th they were applauding the, the, the recent moves within the Church of England towards liberalism. And so they were, you know, they, they were using, uh, you know, they, they, they were using the term progressive, all right, but they were specifically talking about uh, hot-button social issues that that recently the Church of England has done an about face on, and as far as these two priests were concerned, are are going in we're going in the right direction. But the, but then they that they, they said now now okay we we acknowledge that the Church of England is not as progressive as the Episcopalian Church of the United States. However. That can be explained by the fact that the Church of England still has a more conservative element within the church, which is, which is causing the headwinds of change to happen more slowly. But they're confident that over the course of time, they'll get there. Right? I don't know what they said after that, because in disgust, I turned off the television and I walked away. The, the, the individuals who have been given a, a, the role of an under-shepherd, and instead of protecting the flock, instead of leading the flock, instead of guiding the flock, they are consuming the flock. They're consuming the flock. 
Now, if I'd had enough channels and if I'd had enough time and if I'd had enough patience, I could have flipped through channel after channel after channel after channel and I could have found churches promoting materialism. I could have found churches promoting a loveless and a spiritless orthodoxy. I could, I could have found churches um, engaging in antics that look more like a carnival than a church. I could have found message, I could have found congregations where the message is nonsensical, a nonsensical message disguised as a message. I mean, I'm not, not to be unkind, but, but sometimes you, you listen to a message and you're like, what's that dude talking about? Th that's dishonoring to God. Th 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 not, th there's never an excuse to be nonsensical. I, I, I could have found situations where they're good storytellers that entertain more than they exhort and educate. And the list goes on and on and on. You see, the fact of the matter is, it really is a sad state of affairs. So the question is, if the cause is lead my people astray, what, what's the consequence? Well, in verse 6, we see it. Therefore, it will be night for you without vision and darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets the day will become dark over you. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will all cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. You see, it's the same as verse 4. The judgment is the removal of the presence of God. The removal of the presence of God. The removal of the voice of God. You know, whereas I saw a movie in the last couple of weeks where a guy was wanting to shoot an arrow, and there's this really intense scene in this movie, and man, he's, he's, he needs to shoot an arrow, and he reaches back, and there's no arrow there, all right? Needs to shoot an arrow, there's no arrow there. And so the idea here is the, the, these prophets, maybe, maybe in the past sometime, they, they genuinely did hear from the Lord. They, they generally did discern his will. They generally did discern his voice. But through their sin and rebellion, God says that a day is coming in the future, a, a moment of judgment to where they're going to they're gonna reach back for God's word, and it just ain't there. It's been removed in, in judgment. And so we have the prophets, we have the judges, and then we have the leaders, the leaders. Now, this is a separate message Verses 19, 11, and 12, separate message, but it's climactic with the other two. The theme of injustice is the same. Those committing the injustice is expanded, and the consequence is intensified. So in verse 9, now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight. Man, I mean, we ought to put that on a banner. We live in a world where they twist everything that is straight. Such a powerful image for our world today. The twisting of everything that is straight. Justice. You ever scratch your head on what passes for justice these days and you think, man, that just can't be justice. It just can't be justice. The twisting of everything that is straight. Justice. The family. The twisting of everything that is straight. Government, the twisting of everything that is straight. Gender, the twisting of everything that is straight. Why is this happening? Well, sin is an ugly three-letter word with I in the middle of it. Thus, those caught in the grip of sin, they, they twist everything that is straight, and they're doing it for personal gain. And so in verse 10, who, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with, with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price. And her prophets divine for money. If 
if that description placed those people on the precipice of the judgment of God, church, we as a nation are on the precipice of the judgment of God. We are on the precipice of the judgment of God. Yet they're still reaching back for the arrow. If you read my newsletter Wednesday, they, they still think the tree stand's going to hold them up. They say so in verse 11. Yet they lean on the Lord, saying, Is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. The place of false assumptions. They had the temple of I am, but their actions were in danger of leaving them without the I am of the temple. So verse 12 says, Therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of the forest. Now, we need to understand that this is the same consequence as the other two, because what does the temple represent in Jerusalem? It represents the presence of God. It represents the presence of God. So for the temple to be removed is the removal of the presence of God from these people. Man, it, it looks like all is lost in this moment. Surely Assyria knocks in the gate and comes right on in. But that's not what happens. This is one of those great moments, and we'll, we'll conclude with it. This is one of those great moments in Scripture where we're given the rest of the story. I love it when it gives us the rest of the story. A hundred years later, the context is much the same. The people are threatened by an enemy, this time Babylon. The cause is the sin and rebellion of the people, once again Judah. A prophet of Yahweh has the courage to once again tell the truth, this time Jeremiah. He's thrown into prison, and the leaders are considering whether or not to put him to death. And that's when Micah is remembered and quoted And it is from the quotation in Jeremiah, it is from that quotation that we know what happened in this moment with Micah. And so the quotation is Jeremiah 26, verses 16 through 19. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and to the prophets, no death sentence for this man. For he has spoken to us in the name, and remember this is Jeremiah, he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Then some of the elders of the land rose up, and they spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, and here's where we quote verse 12, Thus the Lord of hosts has said, Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become ruins, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all, uh, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord? And the Lord changed his mind about the misfortune which he had pronounced against them. But we are committing a great evil against our, ourselves. Man, I love it when Scripture interprets Scripture. Thus we end where we ended last week. Hezekiah and others humbled themselves and they pray. And God sends an angel, an angel of the Lord, who kills 185,000 warriors in the night. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, slinks home and is eventually killed by his own sons as he worships the false god of Nisroch. Sin and rebellion result in the absence of God's presence. Repentance made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus is the need. God does for us what he cannot do for ourselves. 
And I pray today that the good shepherd, which is Jesus, is your Savior and Lord. And just uh, corporately, I, I said that if, if those people were on the precipice of judgment due to their sin and rebellion, which they certainly were, and which we certainly are, but the good now I want to I want to end on a note of good of good news. What we learn from uh, Second Chronicles and Second Kings and Jeremiah it's repeated for us three times over. What what we learn in all three of those places is that in that moment, in that moment of judgment, in that moment of disaster, some of God's people humbled themselves and repented of their error. And ask God to do what only God can do. And God did it. And so I'm asked the question, Daniel, is the United States of America beyond hope? The answer is no. The United States of America is not beyond hope. But we as a people must humble ourselves. We as a people must repent of our sin. And we as a people must ask God to do what only he can do. The answer's never been in fortified cities. The answer's never been in talented leaders. The answer's never been with alliances with foreign kingdoms. All of those are tried during the time of Isaiah and Micah. The answer's always been faith in God who can and will do what only he can and will do when we humble ourselves and pray. Micah 3. Let's pray together as we close. God, we love you. God, help us feel it. Um, uh, God, we, God, even, even in Micah and Jeremiah's time, God, the, 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 their message was, God, ignored, scorned, silenced, punished, God, that many people were living in the place of false assumptions. And God, such it is today. Things are not near as stable as we sometimes think they are. And God, even on the precipice of justice, there is hope. God, I pray for revival. I pray for humility. I pray for repentance. I pray for a renewal of our land, and I pray that through it all, you are honored and glorified. We love you. Thank you for giving us one another this evening and the opportunity to be together in worship. And it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. Well, amen. Let's turn to the book of Micah this evening, fourth chapter, first verse. You remember, go to Matthew, go backwards, about the middle of those minor prophets, you'll run into, uh, into Micah, seven chapters. And just so, uh, let me remind us of kind of the structure of the book. Micah has seven chapters. There are three sets, so three cycles within Micah. Chapters one and two is the first set. Chapters three, four, and five is the second and chapter 6 and 7 is the third. Each of those sets, there's a, um, uh, there is a, a pattern in each of those sets to where in each of them there are messages of bad news or judgment, but those messages of judgment are followed by messages of encouragement. And uh, so uh, uh, we don't end on the bad news. Uh, God never ends on the bad news. Uh, we end on the good news. And so we are in that second set. We're in the fourth chapter. We're in that second set, chapters 3, 4, and 5. Uh, last week, we dealt with chapter 3. And uh, within, that, uh, within that chapter, we saw three messages of judgment. Those messages were delivered uh, against the, uh, the, the unrighteous judges, 
who were using their position for their own gain instead of for the good of the people, the unrighteous judges. Then there were the false prophets who, uh, if you gave them some money, they'd prophesy peace. And if you didn't, well, you didn't get peace. You got something else, all right? The false prophets, and so there was a message against them. And then there was this cumulative message at the end of chapter 3 uh, where it spoke of the leaders, but it was really speaking to everyone, and it ends at a place of judgment, particularly 3.12, all right? So to, to, to understand the fourth chapter, you have to understand 3.12. So if, you're, if, you're, if you have your Bible there in 3.12, you'll remember where we kind of, kind of left in 3.12. It says, therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. Well, that doesn't sound like good news at all. Uh, that sounds like the, uh, the hammer has fallen, judgment has come. You'll remember from, from last week that that was, that was the message and that was the, uh, the, the prophetic message uh, from God through Micah delivered to the people. You'll remember that 312 did not come about at that time due to the repentance of Hezekiah and some of the other leaders. They humbled themselves, uh, they prayed, and uh, the, the disaster was um, averted uh, at that time. But that's where 312 leaves us. It leaves us with this image of wiped out city, plowed fields, turn off the lights, the party's over. That's where, that, that's where the message in chapter 3 leaves us. And into that, into that message of great judgment, God speaks. And what God speaks into that, that, that silence, that silence created by this picture of judgment, God speaks messages of hope and messages of future and messages of a uh, re restored kingdom. Uh, so chapter 4 has to be read in the silence of 312. City's going to be wiped out. It's all gone. Going to be plowed to the ground in judgment because of the sin and the rebellion of the people. Into that silence, God speaks a message well, actually, three messages of hope, and in the in those three messages, uh, it uh, the the first message talks of the last days. So it's a message of hope, but it's not like tomorrow. I mean, it's it's a message of the last days. So it's 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 far off into the future. And then the second message is a little closer to home. home. It speaks of a return from Babylon. So that's about 114 years out from from Micah. Uh, and then uh, the third message is a message for right now in their lives. Uh, so there, there, there's three messages in this fourth chapter. Uh, so um, let's let's read the chapter together, and I'll give you the divisions of the of the messages after we read the text. So Micah four, beginning in verse one. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain. Actually, let's start in three twelve. Back up one verse. Three three twelve. Therefore, on account of you, Zion, so I want you to notice a couple of words here. Zion is one of them. Therefore, on account of you, Zion, Jerusalem, will be plowed, to the, to, will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem, take note of that word. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain, so take note of that word, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. So I want you to see those three words, Zion, Jerusalem, and mountain. And as we begin to read the fourth chapter, I want you to see that these, these three words keep popping up over and over and over again. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. And it will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and he will render decisions for mighty and distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will lift up sword, nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. 
Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Though all the peoples will walk each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, in that day declares the Lord, I will assemble the lamb and gather the outcasts, even those who have been afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. The Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forevermore. As for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. Even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you, or has your counselor perished? That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And now many nations have been assembled against you who say, let her be polluted and let our eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord and they do not understand his purpose. For he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion, for your horn I will make iron, and your hooves I will make bronze, that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. So those messages and the messages of chapter 5 are what is spoken into the shocked silence of 312, this, this prophecy of the destruction of, of Jerusalem. And th th there's three messages here. So uh, on Sunday mornings, as we, as you know, over the last many months, as we've preached through Ephesians, um, if, if you go to my office right now, I, I got lots of resources on Ephesians. Got several commentaries on, on the book. Got several, uh, other, other tools that, that help me to understand Ephesians. But, but probably the most valuable tool I have about in regard to Ephesians is a seven-volume commentary set written by a man named Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was the pastor of Westminster Chapel. And from 1954 to 1962... Martin Lloyd-Jones preached through Ephesians at Westminster Chapel. You thought it took me a long time. 1954 to 1962. In the early, chat, in the early 70s, Martin Lloyd-Jones took his sermons that he preached from 1954 into 1962, and he edited those sermons into a seven-volume commentary set. He took the messages that he originally preached and he edited his own messages to turn them from messages into a readable commentary. So the author is editing his own work at a future time, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Malachi has done that. Mal Malachi has 20 to 21 messages they are, they are messages from God, Micah, excuse me, switching my minor prophets. Micah has 20 to 21 messages delivered by God through his prophet, Micah. And so he has delivered these messages throughout his ministry, and, and it's a long ministry. He, he tells us in the first chapter that, that he ministered during the reigns of Jotham, um, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. This is a prophet who had a long ministry. He's a contemporary of, of Isaiah, uh, ministered in a very tumultuous time. And he had a long ministry, and he had these individual messages. At a point in time, he takes those messages, and he edits them. He, he, he compiles them into such a way 
to where when we read it, it, it is a whole. It, it, is a, it, it is a collective whole, and it has a central message. And so the 312, the devastation of 312, M- Micah takes messages in chapter 4, and into that moment of shock silence, he provides these messages of hope. And there are three of them in the fourth chapter. There's a message about the last days. There's a message about the return from exile, and there's a message about what God's about to do in Jerusalem in 701 to the Assyrians who are surrounding them. And so these three messages are the the fourth chapter of, of Micah. And so it breaks down like this. The first message begins in verse one. This is the message of the last days. In verse 6, a message begins when it refers to that day, and it's talking about the return from exile. And then verses 9, 11, and 5, 1, each of those sections begin with now, now, now. And so those, specifically the one we're going to look at today at the end of the fourth chapter is talking about what God is about to do with the Assyrians who are, who are surrounding Jerusalem. So, so first, the last days, the last days. Um, we, we have here vivid prophetic imagery. It, it begins with Jerusalem described as a, as a plowed field in 312 as the mountain of the house of the Lord in 4.1. So mountain is contrasted in 3.12 and in 4.1. So in 4.1, it says, and it will come about in the last days, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Well, that sounds a lot better in 3.12. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come, and they will say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So how does a person in 701 B.C. hear this message on the heels of 312. Well, well, this is what they're going to hear. Well, it's not turn out the lights, the party's over. It's not God's abandonment of his covenant people forever. But nor is it a snapping of the fingers and the return to life as normal. The promises are presented as in the future, in the future. It's not a situation, I remember this has been the result of sin and rebellion. Sin and rebellion, which is mentioned in 1.5, and sin and rebellion, which is also mentioned in, in, in the third chapter. So how does someone in 701 B.C. hear this message of the last days? Well, it's not a God turning his back on his people, but nor is it God saying, ah, you didn't really mean that, let's go on with ourselves. No, I mean, that, that's, not, that, that's not what they hear. Judgment is going to come. And so this message of hope is presented as in the future. How are we, the New Testament church, to interpret these prophecies? It it refers to the last days. The the last day promises, if you take notes, take this down. The last day promises of the Old Testament are inaugurated in Christ's incarnation and consummated in his return. They're inaugurated in Christ's incarnation, and they're consummated in his return. So the last days began when Jesus Christ was born into the earth, and the last days conclude when he returns to claim us for his own. The point becomes clearer when we consider the words of Micah's contemporary. So Isaiah ministered in the exact same context that that Micah did. And, I, and I, Isaiah, speaking of the last days, um, in, in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, Isaiah, says, Isaiah 61, 1 through 4, uh, Isaiah says this. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that may be glorified. Then, the, hear this part, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. That's Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 4. And the imagery is synonymous with Micah chapters 3 and 4. Now, I, I share that with you to, 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 to make this truth just apparent for us. In Luke 4, we, we, have, we have Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth. And Jesus stands up to read, as a, as a Jewish male, he stands up to read, which is his right. Jesus stands up to read in, in the Jewish synagogue of Nazareth, and he is handed the, the scroll of Isaiah. And Luke 4 tells us that, that Jesus unrolls the scroll to Isaiah 61, that text I just read. And Jesus reads verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah chapter 61. It says he closes the, the scroll or rolls up the scroll. It says that he sits down. It says that all eyes are fixed on him. And then it says this in Luke, Luke 4, verse 21. It says, and he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All those promises of Isaiah chapter 61, Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The point is reinforced at Pentecost. Peter describes the coming of the Holy Spirit as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, a prophecy describing the last days. And in Acts 2, 17, and it shall be, it says, and it shall be in the last days, the last days, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Old Testament commentator Bruce Waltke explains, according to the New Testament, these prophecies about Israel's golden future find fulfillment, though not consummation, in Christ and his church. He points to Luke 24, 44, Acts 3, 24, 1 Peter 1, 10, for justification for his conclusion. And this is not a stretch or a clever, innovative way to explain away the imagery of the Old Testament. It is the clear teaching of Scripture. Christ is the point. All truth points to him as the truth. Thus, these promises are inaugurated in Christ's incarnation, and they are consummated in his return. The last days are begun at his birth, but brought to completion at his return. So I, I just want us to be careful with our image. I, I want us to be careful with our terminology. I want us to be careful when we say, well, I, I, I think we're living in the last days. Because I'm going I'm to look at you, I'm going to respond. I'm pretty confident we've been there for 2,000 years. We, yes, we are living in the last days. We have lived in the last days since a baby was laying in a manger. When we read the Old Testament and we read the prophecies of the Old Testament, that the last days are, are inaugurated through the birth of Jesus Christ, and they're consummated through his return. The last days are begun at his birth, but brought to completion at his return. Throughout Micah 3, 4, and 5, we have the imagery of, of the restoration of Zion. This is what Scripture leaves us with. 
When we get to the very end of the Bible, one of the very last images we're left with is Revelation 21, 10, and 11. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Now, now, now friends, when we read our Old Testament, I I just want us to, I I want us to be, be, be clear that many of the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled right there in Revelation chapter 21. That they're they're fulfilled not necessarily through a restored earthly Jerusalem, that they're restored through the entrance of the heavenly Jerusalem. That the promises of God are fulfilled in the heavenly Jerusalem that descends from heaven, Revelation 21, verses 10 and 11. This is imagery that we see throughout the fourth chapter of Micah. So in in the middle part of verse 1, the mountain of the house of the Lord. Still in verse 1, the peoples will stream to it. Verse 2, from Zion will go forth the law. They will hammer their swords into plowshares. Verse 4, each of them will sit under his vine. So 3.12 is followed by 4.1 through 5. It is a certain future, a message of hope, which which produces the exclamation of faith in verse 5. So verse 5, though all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So the truth of one through five is reinforced and amplified in six through eight, which gets us to the mess. The distress of 312 is not the end of the matter. God will fulfill every promise in the last days. Old Testament commentator Leslie Allen, he explains it like this. He says, once again, Jerusalem was to stand in noble dignity as proud capital of a realm fit for the king of kings. This and similar promises stayed in men's hearts for many a century. God's people and city did see happier days, which often appeared to be the prelude to fulfillment of God's great words, but they passed unfulfilled into the heritage of the church, living still in a Christian seer's vision of a new Jerusalem, wherein is to be placed the throne of God and of the Lamb, whose servants will reign forever and ever." So salvation is presented as assured, but sin and rebellion will have their consequence. 312 is serious indeed, and though the moment will be delayed in response to repentance, it would come due to renewed rebellion. This warning is delivered through through Micah, it's delivered through Jeremiah, ultimately the hammer falls. Now I got to pause here, my my uh, if, if you want to correct me, you're certain okay. But, but Tara has much more sway to correct me after a message, okay? So you may deliver it through her. But she, she, th- this morning she said, Daniel, you, you, you may want to be a little more clear when you say when somebody comes to me at the end of the day after you've been hammered. <laughs> Fair. Okay? I just meant a hard, rough day, all right? No alcohol involved, all right? Um, so the last days, the, the, the last days. So 312, this message of, hey, Jerusalem, this imagery of, man, Jerusalem just wiped out, nothing, nothing but a field is left due to the sin and rebellion. Into that, into that moment, God speaks a message of hope. But it's not immediate hope, it's far off hope. And it, it, it is God saying through his prophet Micah, Every promise that I have made, I will keep. Every one of them. Every promise I have made, I will keep. The promises I made to David, I'm going to keep those promises. The promise I made to the patriarchs, I'm going to keep those promises. Every promise I have made, I will keep. And in explaining that, he he points to the last days. So we have this message of the last days, but and, and but secondly, we we have a, we have a message of the return from exile. And so, if 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 you have a Bible verse ten, it says, "Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion." 
like a woman in childbirth, dwell in the field. Now, this is the dwell in the field and go to Babylon. This is the, the imagery of, of individuals being carried into the, the captivity into Babylon, having to camp in a field along the way. Dwell in the field, go to Babylon. There you'll be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So when is verse 10 referring to? There's a couple options. Is, is it the next step from 312? Or, it is the, or is it the prophetic mention of the destruction of, of 587 B.C.? Well, obviously, Daniel, it's 587 B.C. That is when... Um, that is when Judah was carried into captivity. And, and, and that is the right answer, but it, we, we need to pause for just a second because it's a little more complicated than that for, for this reason. Babylon was a powerful city of the Assyrian Empire during the time of the writing of Micah. Ba- Babylon is an ancient city, and it is a powerful ancient city. And it is a powerful ancient city during the time of the writing of Micah. Throughout Micah 3 and 4, Micah has referred to Judah, the nation of Judah, by simply referring to the capital of Judah, which is Jerusalem. So kind of with that precedent, what what Micah could be doing is he could be referring to 312, this destruction. It, it, It could be the very next moment is that Babylon could be being used as a, the, one of those powerful cities within Assyria. And it, it's a possibility because ex- that's exactly what Isaiah does in his prophecy. In Isaiah 13 and 14, there's this, um, uh, this reference to Babylon. It speaks of the king of Babylon. And I mean, it's, there's two chapters where it speaks of Babylon extensively. But when you, when you understand it in context, context, it is clearly talking about Babylon as the, one of the capital cities of Assyria. And so, not so quick type stuff. So, Micah could be doing that here, just like his contemporary Isaiah did, but he's not. Micah is referring here to the future event in these people's lives of 587 B.C. when they will be carried off into exile. Uh, Babylon, and, and, and wh- why, why do I draw that conclusion? Babylon, which was a vassal kingdom of Assyria at the time of the writing of Micah, if you remember from the Old Testament, in 705 B.C., Merodach Baladan, which is the, the ruler of Babylon, which is a vassal of Assyria. Remember, Hezekiah gets sick. Remember this event in the Old Testament? Hezekiah gets sick, but he recovers. And it's this moment of repentance in his life, and he recovers. And in, re- in response to that recovery, Babylon, the king of Babylon, the ruler of Babylon, comes to Hezekiah in Jerusalem uh, because he's just a good old guy. No, not so much. I mean, this is all about political intrigue. It's all about alliances. It's all about, hey, we're Babylon, and we don't really like the fact that Assyria is controlling us. Hezekiah, why don't you join up with us, and we'll overthrow the Assyrians. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. Remember Hezekiah? Merodic Baladin gets there, and, and Hezekiah's like, hey, guys, come on in. And, you know, I mean, he, he shows him everything, remember? Shows him the treasury, shows him everything. 705 B.C. And do, do you remember Isaiah? God sends Isaiah to Hezekiah, and Isaiah confronts Hezekiah, and he says, what did that man see? And Hezekiah says, we saw everything. And you you remember what Isaiah says? Isaiah says, "Because, because you have done this, a day will come, a day will come in the future when you will be carried away, your Israel, Israel will be carried away into Babylon because you did this. You remember what Hezekiah, I always thought this was kind of lame. I, I, Isaiah says, well, let the will of the Lord be done. At least it'll be okay in my time. I mean, that's what it says. 
But that is 705 BC. That is right in the context of what we're talking about here in Micah. So right in the context of what we're talking about here in Micah, there's a prophecy guaranteeing that a day will come when Judah is carried away into Babylon. And that is what is being referred to in the middle part of the fourth chapter. That verse is 2 Kings 20, 16, and 17. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all of your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Well, this happened in 587 BC, 114 years after the events of Micah. The wall is completely destroyed. The temple is completely destroyed. The city is burned to the ground and is left a rubble heap. The threat of 312 wasn't avoided. It was merely delayed. So a couple of truths worthy of observation. Well, really three truths. Number one, sin and rebellion mentioned in 1, 5, and 3, 8. Sin and rebellion always have a consequence. And that consequence is the judgment of God. Romans 3 teaches us of God's passing over of sin in grace, allowing for a time when Jesus would pay for those sins upon the cross. So judgment can be delayed. Judgment can even be transferred in the case of Jesus Christ. But there's always a consequence to sin and rebellion. Always. Second observation. Fortified cities or awesome allies are a fool's hope. Assyria is not the problem. Babylon is not the problem. Rome is not the problem. The system is not the problem. Sin is the problem. And the judgment of God is the consequence. Faith and trust in God is the solution. That's the message of Micah. It's the message of Isaiah. Observation number three. The picture of judgment in, in, throughout Micah, the picture of judgment is always followed by a picture of redemption. The picture of judgment is always followed by a picture of redemption. Isn't that what the book of Romans does? Ro- 118, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and, go- and ungodliness. Romans 118, well, man, and then it just lays it out. Sin and unrighteousness. But then we get to chapter 3, right? We get to chapter 3, where it speaks about God paying for our sin through Christ and how he is just and the justifier of the ungodly and, and how Jesus is our propitiation. And so throughout the Bible, we see this, this pattern of the judgment of God is not the last word. The, the, the judgment of God is followed by God offering redemption to his people if they'll repent and place saving faith in him. And we see it here in Micah, verse 10, middle part of the verse. For now you will go out of the city, you will dwell in a field, you will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Such was the promise and such was the case. The Babylonian exile was concluded through the decree of Cyrus, the Persian king. Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and others led God's people back to Jerusalem. The wall is rebuilt. The temple is rebuilt. The city is rebuilt. The promises of God are fulfilled. Micah 4, so a telescope. So the end of 312, this message of great judgment, into 312, into that silent moment, God speaks a message which is way off the last days. And then God speaks a message which is closer, the return from the exile. And the third and final message of Micah is is now. I mean, it is what is going on right then in 701 B.C. If you'll remember from our previous messages, Assyria is a force to be reckoned with. Aram is gone. Israel is gone. The fortified cities of the Judean foothills are gone or about to be. The inhabitants of Judah are huddled together behind the walls of Jericho, uh, behind the walls of Jerusalem. All hope seems to be lost. And then God speaks. Look at verse 11. And now, I mean 701. And now many nations have been assembled against you who say, let her be polluted. Let our eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his purpose. For he has gathered them 
like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion. For your horn I will make iron, and your hooves I will make bronze, that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. This is what God says when, in regard to Assyria. In regard to Assyria, God says, that he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. What happens on the threshing floor? You you take sheaves and you you throw them down and there's these teeth and stones and they they grind. You don't want to be under it. You don't want to be in the threshing floor. What what, what is God's opinion of this, this arrogant, aggressive, apparently unstoppable nation which at this very moment is in the Judean foothills, about to surround Jerusalem, about to siege Jerusalem, about to tear it down and to carry it away. What's God's opinion? God's opinion is they are sheaves been brought to the threshing floor. So imagine, like, remember the Exodus? I mean, that, we, we, we know that event so well. Remember the remember when God's people when they're when they're coming out of when they're coming out of Egypt how God God backs them up to the Red Sea and you remember Pharaoh and his armies they're you know coming down on them and you remember uh, you know Moses you know leads the people through the Red Sea and there's the you know wall of water on both sides and so there there's Israel and then there's uh, there's the Egyptians, nothing between them except for uh, the cloud of fire, which is the presence of God, and all night long, they're going through the Red Sea. And you remember that the, the Israelites come out on the other side, and you, you remember how it didn't work out so well for Pharaoh and the Egyptians? In an instant, everything changes. In an instant, victory is won. In an instant, the battle, which has always been the Lord's, is 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 one and 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 that that event illustrates this event. God, God says they are that they are sheaves which have been brought to the threshing floor. He says, "Man, I'm going to give you horns of iron. I'm going to give you hooves of bronze, and you're going to pulverize your enemy." God, God says they're sheaves to the threshing floor. They have been brought out for such a purpose as this. Just like Pharaoh and the Egyptians are brought into the middle of the Red Sea and crushed by the hand of God, God says. That's going to happen again. And guess what? That's exactly what happened again. You'll remember what we've looked at the last few weeks. We've we've seen that an an angel of the Lord is sent out against the Assyrians, and God's word tells us that in one night, 185,000 Assyrians are struck down and killed. Sennacherib the king goes back to the capital city of Assyria. Eventually, he's in the, the, the temple of his god, Nisroch, worshiping two of his sons, come in, ambush him, and kill him. That's hard to see in the moment of 312, in, in Micah 312, this, this message of judgment, this message of judgment. But, but, but into that moment, God uses Micah to speak three messages. The first message is of last days. Everything I promise is going to be fulfilled. Second message is of um, the, the return from exile. Even though a day is going to come as consequence to your sin, where you are going to go into, into the exile of Babylon, a day is coming when, when I'm going to I'm going to bring you back, and that happens through Cyrus the Persian, and um, we, we, we read about that in Nehemiah and Ezra and, and other places. The third message is, is the right now. The Assyrians have surrounded and are surrounding Jerusalem, and God says, sheaves for the threshing floor. Sheaves for the threshing floor. I have brought them out. I have brought them out, and I will execute my judgment upon them in this moment. That's exactly what happens. I, I would just leave us with, with, with a word from Moses and then a, a word from Micah. The, the, this is what Moses said to the people right before the Red Sea. Moses said to the people, do not fear. 
Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, which you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Why? The Lord will fight for you. You will keep silent. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Such it was at the Exodus, such it was at the siege of Jerusalem, and such it will be for the church of the living God today. And sometimes it feels like I'm being surrounded by Syrians. I'm going to talk about this evening. But, you know, we, 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 we live in a world to where, man, sometimes it, man, where's the hope? Where, where, where's the hope? It, 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 just, it just seems like, man, we just, the world just continues to go in the wrong direction. And re- really, sometimes you really can't feel like you're just surrounded by enemies. And in Micah 4.1, God just reminds us, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will stream to it. So what does that mean? It means what God did on the Exodus and what God did in Jerusalem is what God does, and a day is coming when God is going to do it. And in an instant, in an instant, all that is wrong will be made right. In an instant, all that is upside down will be flipped over right side up. In an instant, all the lies that have been told will be washed away by the truth. In an instant, all those who have mocked Jesus Christ will be at his feet, acknowledging that he is Lord and King of all. In an instant, what God has done, he does. And what God does, he will do. So regardless of the context, regardless of what things look like right now, sheaves to the threshing floor, God is in control. And in an instant, all things will be made right. So the confession of verse 5 is our Confession. It is our confession. The, the, you know, if I can find it. Shouldn't add lib. Okay. Give me just, okay, here we go. Verse 5. Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That is our confession as the church. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for truth. God, help us to understand it. God, it, it can't appear complicated. And God, we just humbly acknowledge the fact that uh, God's spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. And God, so we just ask that we, uh, in humility, uh, God, are, are sitting at your feet desiring to understand truth, God, for ourselves, uh, but also that we can communicate it to others, Father. So, God, we, we thank you for the truths of Micah. We thank you that they have application in our lives today. We love you, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.